Hello, friends. Greg Kokel here. Uh, Stand to Reason special show today since I am off schedule because I am uh, probably right now on my back (laughs) in a hospital somewhere (laughs) in Southern California because they cut my leg off and then sewed it back on again. (laughs) Sounds pretty gruesome, doesn't it? Well, it's just a hip replacement, so... And from what I understand, and that would be January 4, when uh, the operation, I guess I'd have to use past tense now, took place. Not sure when this particular broadcast will air. But since I'm not in studio taking your calls on those days, I have not left you as orphans. I am here, uh, just out of time sync. Um Offering you a show, and we're what we're doing here uh, is principally uh, doing open mic calls, and many of you know about that. You can dial eight five seven three four two five seven eight seven and uh, leave a message, a voice message, which is basically your question. Try to keep it short, and uh, and then we'll play your voice message on the air. And I'll respond. That's what we do, open mic calls. Now, you can dial 857-DIAL-STR, D-I-A-L-S-T-R. I actually never like those versions because it's so hard to find the letters on the phone, you know. So 857-342-5787. Or you can go to our homepage and then look under podcast and live broadcast, and there's a feature there for you to do the same. And yeah, nice thing about this, you get your kind of live call in, so to speak. I don't get to interact with you personally, but you do get to talk and leave your question, and it can be more involved than a a, a tweet or the shorter versions we have at hashtag STRask that Amy Hall and I do. And uh, so, and we will be doing that um, for the bulk of the, uh, I'll do two shows like that for you. But uh, I, I, I wanted to read something to you. Um, it, it, it's almost in the category of truth is stranger than fiction. <clears throat> and here um, I'm talking about how people take um, incredibly sophisticated biological um, systems of sort, and then they simply give the nod to Darwinian evolution, that the creatures have adapted somehow to manifest this capability, okay? I mean, and there's gazillions of them. I I actually just uh, last week was in Grand Rapids with Sondervan filming the 10-session video series to go with the new book, Street Smarts, which will come out in late June. And uh, I was talking a little bit about that and how, for example, <clears throat> animals can navigate with GPS, so to speak. It's a virtual GPS, but they use the um, magnetic field around the Earth for that purpose. Um, and when I say animals, <clears throat> I mean living creatures. I don't mean like there are mammals that have developed the ability to do this. If one type of mammal, say a whale, which uses this feature, were able to do that, to me that would be uh, beyond, um, how, it, it, it would stretch the, the, the boundaries of credulity to think that such a thing could happen by accident that some kind of capability to navigate in a way that ensures their survival of this particular beast here, um, that that could come about through a series of biological accidents. Just think of your GPS, your own GPS, your iPhone, whatever. I mean, you're not going to get a a series of, of, of mechanical accidents that's going to produce uh, the capability of a, a flip phone to become a GPS with a screen on it or something like that. Well, given enough time. No, it doesn't matter how much time you're given. Common sense tells you that. And by the way, nobody has ever demonstrated how these things actually came about through evolution. It's just presumed. Incidentally, I just mentioned the whale, if it were one. But mammals can do this, whales, 
Fish could do this, right? Salmon. Uh, butterflies could do this. That's insects. That's not even a vertebrate. Monarchs. Um, let's see, what else? Wildebeest could do it. That's another mammal, I guess. Um, and there's a couple of other. Actually, there's a whole bunch more. In other words, there are all these critters, sea turtles. Okay, that's a reptile. All these cr birds in their migrations. Uh, and by the way, in the case of monarchs, these monarchs, after they leave their nesting, their winter hibernation, which requires that they live for three months, which most monarchs don't live that long. They only live a few weeks, the adult version. Then they start moving north and reproducing, and then they start folding, falling back south again, reproducing. And so like the sixth generation is the special generation, which monarch, in a certain sense, remembers where it its great, 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 great ancestor was born and goes back to the same location. So it's got to know the location, then it has to get to the location by using uh, the, by navigating using the um, magnetic field to do that. And there are lots of things, and by the way, you don't need to watch Christian movies to know this. It's amazing. And so notice all of these critters that all have the same kind of GPS device. They are separated wildly on the evolutionary uh, chain of life. You've got five different classes. You've got reptile of vertebrates. Reptiles, I don't know if amphibians can do this, but that's one of the classes. Certainly birds, certainly fish, certainly mammals. You have a four out of five can do this. But they're they're totally separated. They're, yes, they're in a class, but you know, widely distinct. But then you go outside of that, and you have butterflies. They're insects. They're not even vertebrates, for goodness sake. They deviated, according to the evolutionary characterization, long, long, long before. So, you know, how do they at each automatically, accidentally develop? the same capability, GPS capability. Do, do, do you see, you don't need to be a scientist to know that this is not possible. This is a design feature. No duh. Okay, so <clears throat> that's just a predicate to this piece I want to read to you here. <clears throat> I am reading from the In Fisherman magazine, which is one of the best fishing magazines available. I subscribe and... Uh, because I'm a fisherman and I like to read all about stuff and you learn how to be more effective catching fish the few times that I can go out and try. So this one is um, the feature called Bits and Pieces that has something to do with the scientific elements of fish, all right? And uh, there are doctors that have been responsible, I mean doctorate people, that do the research and then they, but it's interesting how they express themselves. So this one is titled Largemouth Bass Feeding Mechanics. And apparently there are two different ways that bass, largemouth bass, big mouth bass, feed or they accomplish feeding. They can ram feed or they can suction feed, okay? Ramming feed is pretty much what it sounds like. They ram the fish with an open mouth, and they grab it, and they swallow it, the prey fish. And suction feeding is when they have something not so aggressive, and they just flare their gills, and they suck this bait or whatever it is, a little minnow or maybe a worm or a crustacean, a crawfish or something off the bottom or wherever it happens to be, a leech, and they eat it by that way. It's a little negative pressure thing, and... And I've actually seen it happen in tanks, and there could be a bait, like a plastic worm on a line. They take the hook off, but they're just doing this for demonstration purposes. It's maybe two or three feet away from this, or let me just say two. Now maybe that's a little far. Maybe maybe 18 inches away from this largemouth bass, it just flares its gills, and that bait disappears. It just sucks it right up. 
And when you're fishing, that has a very distinctive feel on the line. You, you know, if you're not alert, you don't know what it feels like. You may miss that you've just got a strike, that the fish has your bait in its mouth and you need to, you know, s- set the hook and play the fish and release it. Okay, so anyway, so that's feeding mechanics. But there's another, there are two ways that they can sense. And one is through sight, obviously, but another is through what's called a lateral line. And it's just a line of scales going down the side of their body. Now, I want to read two paragraphs to you. And uh, this is written by Dr. Hal Schramm. And he's one of their zoologist uh, type guys, scientists, giving information that's good and useful. But He's explaining about their feeding habits because bass can feed if they're in it in the dark. They can feed in water that's that's completely murky, so you can't see uh, two inches. They can feed successfully even if they're blinded, because they have another mechanism that allows them to locate prey. Now, keep in mind they're locating prey that's like other little fish swimming around. You ever try to catch your bluegills? I'm sorry, your um, goldfish? Reach down with your hand and try to catch your goldfish? Or even with a little net to try to change the water? It's not easy. A bass can do that without eyes. How's that? Because of this other feature. So, reading from the article, Largemouth Bass Feeding Mechanics, a little bit on fish anatomy may help you understand how the lateral line system is involved in feeding. Most anglers have observed the lateral line as a slightly arched line on each side of the bass from behind the gill covers to near the tail. What you're seeing is a line of scales with pores or holes that allows water to flow through a canal under under the poured scales, that is P-O-R-E-D, the scales with holes in them, the water goes through these holes and the water... Uh, the, the sensory cells in the canal can detect the water movement. Okay, keep in mind what we're talking about. We're just talking about a little kind of a sieve feature uh, running in a lateral line. So water goes into these little holes, and there are sensory cells that can sense the flow. Okay, so what? These are not visible without magnification and careful searches. Searching is an elaborate system of lateral line canals on the head and jaws of the bass. A bass may get some information about nearby prey and especially potential predators from the sensory cells on its side. Wait a minute. So this water is flowing and something is feeling the flow of the water down underneath the scales in these little bitty channels and that communicates information to them about prey or something preying on them? Yep, that's how it works. All right, I continue. But it's the lateral line system on the head of the fish that provides fine-tuned information about the position of the prey. The system is sensitive enough for a bass to track a prey fish by the turbulent that the turbulence that the tail produces as it swims. Now think about this if the fish is blind, and, and that's the point, you, it can just by these little cell, uh, scales with holes in them and the water flowing through them, they're able to figure out that there's another little fishy in front of them. All right. So that's just the background of the anatomy. Now I'm reading the last paragraph. Bass are extremely well adapted. How did, how did bass adapt the ability through microscopic changes over time, each change making it a little bit more effective at capturing prey when it's blind. No, this is a complex system that only works together as a system. It didn't adapt through natural selection for that. I mean, you see that that defies, that defies credulity. It's like... That's I can't believe that. And I don't, actually. Now, the reason that they say it's adapted is because Dr. Halshram is convinced of the Darwinian model, and therefore everything must have resulted because of adaptation through natural selection, working on mutations, one little step at a time. Okay, 
Uh, the, the problem is when you have these uh, very complex systems that are irreducibly complex, that is, you can't have half a system like this, and that works to catch half as many little critters for the bass that's feeding, and then it gets a little better and catches more. It's either on or off, and it's off if it isn't completely done properly, and all by accident. But he says adapted because this is the explanation. Even though in, in, in almost every single case where things are said to have evolved, there is no independent information that that particular capability did evolve over a period of time. There's not the data there to demonstrate that. It is just simply assumed. The whole system has some rationale behind it and some evidence behind it. And so consequently, they just, all right, this must be true. We wave the wand over all of these characteristics that are wildly counterintuitive to believe they happened by accident. And they just say, bass are extremely well adapted. I continue, for feeding in a range of light conditions, including total darkness. What I, as a biologist, find fascinating is that bass use a range of options to capture prey, successfully depending on the sensory input. What I, as an angler, find fascinating, but also a bit intimidating, is that the final act of capturing the prey occurs in only 30 to 40 milliseconds, roughly one-thirtieth of a second. And if you think you have a fast hook set, Think again. Last line. Okay, clever ending. I like the ending from a writing perspective, but one thirtieth of a section, re, second. Remember, I've seen the bass in the aquariums, you know, at fishy shows and stuff, and they drop the little bait there, and it's sitting a foot or so in front of them. All of a sudden, it's, it just disappears. You don't see it traveling to the mouth of the fish. It just disappears visually because the suction is so instantaneous, and it's fast. Boom, it's gone. One thirtieth of a second. Okay, now the ability of a flat a bass to flare its gills that itself and and to create suction to eat that itself is is complex. It requires a lot of things going on at once, but nothing like the ability of these highly sensitive sens sensory cells strung along the lateral line of a bass and also in places around its face. So as the water flows through at different rates, it can translate the water flow into the positioning of prey and have a meal. Capture the swimming thing with its mouth, either ramming it or suctioning it. Probably more suctioning going on when you can't see as well, more ramming when the water's clear. The place I fish, the water's really clear. So I learned some things about fishing here, but never what I'm looking at is the the what would you say the the kind of reflexive attributing of a complex system, an unbelievably con, complex system that relates to a bass's ability to eat and therefore survive, attributing this to complete chance. Bass are extremely well adapted. No, they're not well adapted. They are well designed. <clears throat> they're not even that smart, but they are really well designed to capture prey and to avoid being captured. Okay, and uh, of course that's my side. Actually, both are my side. I I, I don't want them to avoid <laughs> being captured by me if I'm fishing. And I, I, I want them to capture what they think is prey, which is my bait. And I want to fool them. And uh, one way you fool them is with a bait that gives off sensations. It's got a flappy tail or something. Even if it's made of plastic, it moves. It disturbs the water. They feel the water disturbance. They have the ability in their little brain slash minds to distinguish and locate prey and eat it to survive because they have such a sophisticated system. I mean, think of bats, too. Dragonflies, you know what dragonflies eat? They eat mosquitoes. 
You ever see a dragonfly? You ever see, you, know, you try to smack a mosquito. You know how hard it is. I use the clap method because when I use the clap method like that to swat a mosquito in the air, there's a lot of surface area that I got to work with. So if the mosquito zooms around like it does, I have a better chance to get it. But um, dragonflies don't have hands. They have an itty-bitty mouth, and they are able to capture that itty-bitty f- mosquito that's flying all around and hard to get. They get it, and they eat it. How do they do that? That is a highly sophisticated, uh, highly designed system because nothing else is adequate to explain it. Can't just wave the wand of chance and let it go as that, okay? Nothing else is adequate to explain it. All right, let's take a break. Greg Kokel here on Stand to Reason. Stay with us. All right, friends, Greg Kokel here, giving you a piece of my mind, as I do characteristically, on uh, Tuesdays from 4 until 6, Los Angeles time. That number, just for the record, you can't call that today uh, because I'm not here today. <laughs> That's weird, isn't it? Uh, 562-424. No, wait, not that one. 855 855- 243-9975 is our standard number, 855-243-9975. Uh, just to let you know here at the beginning of the year, we have releasing and is now available uh, a new STRU course called Making Abortion Unthinkable. It's taught by Alan Schleeman. And by the way, there is a whole lot of stuff happening in that whole field right now. I mean, it's like when Roe v. Wade got got overturned the 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 culture came unglued and uh now there is a very aggressive attempt by a lot of um organizations uh, of uh, businesses you know a whole line of slew of them that are actively working to encourage women who get pregnant to get an abortion rather than taking her maternity leave and all the other things that are dis, uh, inconvenient for big business. And there's a lot of pressure that's going on, too, and lots of crazy things that are happening. It just You just think things can't get crazier, and then they get crazier. So um, taking advantage of Alan Schleeman's course on the STR University um, platform, Making abortion unthinkable is really, really important. All right. You go to training.str.org for that. And uh, also another note, uh, John Noyce is on To The Point Live the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. And John will be on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. You go to str.org and scroll down to the bottom for links to our social media. But that's the second and fourth Wednesday each month, and he's on at noon. It doesn't say that on this one, but I know that is like noon Los Angeles time. All right. Uh, one more thing is that we uh, have three more dates this spring for our wonderful reality conference. And if you never go to any reality conference, if you just want to go to one, this is the one to go to. We have never had a conference that's this good. And frankly, I'm wondering, what are we going to do next year? Uh, so I, this is a completely unbiased response. I mean, I, I am, I, I, I'm giving you a, an accurate characterization. I do like all the SDRUs, but I'm sorry, uh, the uh, realities, but I, 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 this one stands alone, especially Friday night. If you only go to one, go to this one. And uh, Dallas is February 24th to 25th. Uh, which will also be on live stream, by the way. It's not the same as being there, but if you can't make it there, anywhere in the country you can do it on live stream. We'll be in Philly on March 24th and 25th, and we'll be in Augusta, Georgia, April 21st and 22nd. Okay, let's... um, I want to get my uh, list of calls here for uh, open mic. And let's see what we have here. Let's um, let's just just start at the top, which is the 
oldest call, the one who's been waiting the longest to get an answer. And uh, let me just see if I can find my notes on this. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Um, let's have Mike Mike Mitchell, who's been a long term stand a reason friend. And uh, I mean, like decades, right? Mike Mitchell's been around. So nice to hear from Mike. Hi, Greg. My name is Michael Mitchell. I'm a longtime friend of the show and of STR over a decade. My question is about the label evangelicalism. I choose not to call myself an evangelical because, honestly, I don't know what that means. Hmm. So many different people have different ideas. And I know of some Christian groups out there who consider themselves evangelical with whom I disagree. I don't need to label them here. Uh, I know you call yourself an evangelical. I wonder if you can explain to me the roots of the label, how it came about, and what the classical definition of evangelical is that would go a long way in helping me decide whether I wish to call myself an evangelical or not. Uh, anything you'd like to say on the topic, I would love to listen to. Thank you for taking my question. Well, thank you, uh, Michael, and for your long-term relationship with Stand to Reason. Um, and it's a very fair question, and I think it is important to try to figure out how to characterize ourselves. Sometimes just saying, I'm a Christian, well, that's even more uh, of a rubber, rubber or wax nose, I guess is the phrase they use, than, than evangelical. Evangelical narrows things down a bit more. Christian can mean such a variety of different things, and even groups that are clearly not Christian, like LDS, Mormons, um, by any classical definition, by any definition of the word, would not be qualify as Christian. Well, we believe in Jesus. Well, so do Muslims. Are Muslims Christian? No, of course not. Well, they believe in Jesus. There's more in the Quran about Jesus than there is about Muhammad. So, you know, uh, th that's a very flexible word, too. I sometimes characterize myself as a Christian, and um, I, uh, you know, I live with that. And I also characterize myself as an evangelical Christian if somebody asked me to narrow it down a little bit, because I still, I think the, the term is still meaningful, but I am sensitive to your concerns, uh, Michael. So uh, let me give you the, 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 the kind of bare minimum definition, which doesn't really apply nowadays to everybody who calls himself an evangelical, all right? And uh, the bare minimum definition—I'll give you Tim Challey's definition. Here's what he writes. So what is the historical significance of the word? An evangelical used to be—and so that would be, this is the classical foundation of the concept—used to be a person who stood firm on two key convictions, the authority of Scripture and the doctor, doctrine of justification— by faith alone, in Christ alone. These correspond to the doctrines of sola scriptura, which is considered the formal principle of the Reformation, and sola fide, the material principle of the Reformation. What he means by formal and material is the, 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 the foundational principle is, we, is the, 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 only the Scripture is authoritative to speak for God. All right, um, that that is God's word, sola scriptura. That's the formal. Now, when you go to the scripture and you ask, "What is the substance of the doctrine of salvation?" It's sola fide, sola gratia, the by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, sola Christe. So these are all the solas that are associated with the um, the Reformation, and you could see how they're related. You have the formal principle of the authority of Scripture, and then the doctrine of justification by faith alone, grace alone, in Christ alone. Now, um, Christianity today um, offers basically the same thing. To say one is an evangelical is to embrace the Reformation teaching on sola gratia, and sola scriptura. So there is so they're focusing on grace alone, but these are all tied together. 
faith, grace, Christ. They're all tied together. Christ produces the work that by faith is received, and that work is the grace of God for salvation. Okay, so if you believe the authority of Scripture, inerrancy of Scripture, and that salvation is by grace alone. Now, by the way, those are Reformation doctrines because they are in contrast to the chief theological counterpart, which would have been at that time the Roman Catholic Church, because they have multiple sources of authority. Scripture, yes, but also the teaching magisterium, the Pope speaking from the chair, although that didn't come till after the Reformation, um, and also uh, uh, holy uh, tradition. So you have these multiple sources of authority vested in this ecclesi- ecclesiastical body called the Roman Catholic Church. Reformation said, no, it's the Scripture alone. It's just the Scripture that has the authority. And if we speak authoritatively, any Christian, it is only because the things that we speak with authority on are based not on our authority, but an accurate reading of the text, okay? And, um, and, and when it comes to salvation, the salvation is by faith alone, through Christ alone, uh, due to His grace alone, not by works, as Paul writes in Ephesians 2, lest anyone boast, okay? So that's what characterizes evangelicals. Now, of course, we think of the word evangelistic, we think evangelical, and and so evangelicals were evangelistic, too, because they had, they had discovered this wonderful good news of through an understanding of the Scripture, what the Scripture teaches about salvation, we learned that there is grace from the Lord, and we apprehend the grace through faith because of what Christ did. That's good news. Off we go, and then we tell other people. Now, the problem is, is there were a whole bunch of things that seemed to be part of the package of inerrancy. So if you were pledging, I believe, sola scriptura, there was a bunch of stuff that kind of came along with that, and that material stuff, the formal principle, and the material stuff that followed, all the substance, all the content of that. And I remember a number of years ago, Evangelical Theological Society, there was quite a—there was a kerfuffle about the whole idea of what does God know, and there were two different views— both said God knows everything that God can know, but one said God knows everything, period. He can know everything, and others said God knows everything that can be known, and free will actions of individuals can't be known by God. It's not a feature of knowledge, and so therefore God's knowledge, at least by the classical term, was limited. So this was a big discussion that was going on. It was called open theism, or uh, is that the right term? Yeah. Um, the, the idea that God, his, he doesn't have knowledge of the, of the human, human decisions, and, uh, or else if God already knew what people were going to decide, at least on their characterization, the actions would not be free. But they're determined somehow by the knowledge of God. Now, that actually doesn't work. But in any event, that was kind of the thinking, the impulse. But here are all of these people now who are taking exception with a classical understanding of the um, 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 omniscience of God that are part, in ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society. And what they realized is that the, since the requirement for being ETS is to affirm the Trinity and to affirm the uh, inerrancy of Scripture, they had presumed a whole bunch of things would kind of come with that package that are no longer part of that package. They're no longer presumed. And so maybe they needed to readjust the uh, pledge that members of the ETS were making. Uh, I don't actually think anything changed, but this was part of the concern, because, well, look at if you get believe the authority of Scripture then, and it's inerrant, then you're going to believe in omniscience, classically considered, but now there's these deviations. And now, to Michael's point, there's lots and lots of deviations, so there are lots of people who might identify as evangelical that would have views that I would consider, complete, as an evangelical, completely heterodox, not just a variation— but it's off the reservation, right? 
but they still call themselves evangelicals. So that's the problem, Michael, that you're you're struggling with, and and you're you're facing. And um, I think, well, there's your foundational definition, and I think if you hold to that definition, which you do, you can still call yourself an evangelical according to that. Even though there are some people who call themselves evangelicals that deny those things. The difficulty that you run into is if you reject that or don't call yourself an evangelical, what are you going to call yourself? How would you identify yourself with Christ? What terminology would you use to do that? And it turns out there's just seems no other terminology available. You could say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, but that's much broader, actually, than evangelical. You could say, uh, I'm a Christ follower or a follower of Christ. You could say, I'm a disciple of Christ, but that sounds like a denomination. Um, what would you say? So this is why I will go in some situations for Christian, uh, if in that circumstance I felt that Christian was communicating more or less what I, what I am in the, to the hearing of the person I'm talking with, or if um, I might say I'm an evangelical Christian to distinguish me from Roman Catholic or Orthodox Christians of, uh, 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 of, of a variety of Orthodox denominations, or, um, or, or maybe in some people's minds from LDS or Jehovah's Witnesses, which are all kind of in the broader and very, very broadly under Christendom, but are distinguished uh, by various doctrines, in my view, very clearly as non-Christian enterprises, even Christian science. It's not scientific and it's not Christian. So um, nevertheless, people without understanding of these things can get confused fairly easily. So um, uh, that's why sometimes it's important for me to say evangelical Christian to bring clarity. But apart from those terms, I don't know what else would be helpful. And it maybe sometimes it's just a matter of in conversation with people. If you go further, you can clarify those terms. And uh hope that's helpful. I, I do think it's a, a, a challenge nowadays um, the word evangelical is very, very broad application. It, it just in practice. So, all right. So uh, let's just, uh, I think, time for another break. Let's do that, and I'll uh, scan <laughs> these questions, see where we go next. Greg Kokel here for Stand a Reason. <music> Final segment here for this hour. Got a couple of uh, interesting calls here from uh, Open Mic Calls. Remember, that number is uh, 857-342-5787, or you can just go to our homepage under podcast and the live broadcast that you can leave your questions there. Uh, We have a question from Brandon. Is it Giles or Giles? G-I-L-E-S. But let's just say Brandon. How about that? Hi, Greg. Long-time listener and strategic partner, first-time mm, questioner. Thank you. And I knew I could turn to you after listening to you and Lisa Childers talk about this very subject. I've been attending a large, multi-campus church for the past five and a half years with my wife. My daughter was saved and baptized at this church, and it's become a huge part of our family. But about a year ago, the beloved senior pastor announced his retirement and brought in a new senior pastor-elect to transition over the 12 months After those 12 months have passed, there's been a marked change in the goals of my church. First and foremost, they seem to have moved towards the idea of getting as many people as possible through the door, not focusing on evangelism or the discipleship of its current members. There have been a significant amount of resignations from campus pastors, worship leaders, youth outreach, and community outreach pastors, as well as mission pastors leaving their posts, and no explanations have been given by the church. Additionally, we were extremely confused and turned off when we entered the sanctuary hall a few months ago and instrumental versions of Eminem and Notorious B.I.G. songs were playing. Additionally, at the entry to the foyer a few weeks ago, there was Queen playing for everybody to hear. Finally, a church of this size relies heavily on small groups for discipleship. The last couple small groups we have been a part of has had members start speaking progressive Christianity talking points. 
affirming abortion, homosexuality, and same-sex marriage. We have stopped attending those groups for these reasons. What should I do, Greg? I don't want to judge. The pastor's sermons seem biblically sound, albeit with a lot of catchphrases versus actual verses, but other aspects of the church seem to say different. Wow. Um, I'm wondering if we've talked to Brandon before, um, thinking of a particular city that uh, has a very large church with a lot of campuses that had a long tradition of discipleship, and I've respected <clears throat> excuse me, what's been going on in that church for a long time. I could be totally mistaken as to the location of this church, but Brandon, there's a lot of things that you've said here that <laughs> are not good signs, all right? Um, you have a change of leadership, all right? Nothing wrong with that. You have a, a tradition in a church that goes back a long way. Your experience with the church, your daughter's experience, really good. Now you have a shift in leadership, and you see a big shift. And the way you characterize it is, it's kind of like they really want to just get a lot of people in. Now, if they're getting a lot of people in and they're young people, it's understandable why they would be tempted to go with um, pop music. Now, I'm not against pop music itself, but I, I am suspicious of a lot of it, and I, I don't think Queen is a Christian. <laughs> you know, uh, I actually don't know a lot about these performers, but um, I, 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 I know something about that one, and I think... I mean, the, this, there's a concern here, obviously. And why is it that they're doing this? Why draw people on these pretexts? There's a famous saying that what regarding evangelism and conversions, etc., that what you're won by is what you're won to. What you are won by is what you are one to. So if you are one by a man-centered gospel, you are going to be one to a man-centered Christianity. If you are one by a, a gospel of repentance and uh, uh, transformation and turning from sin and trusting in Christ and the grace of Christ and service, you know, all of that, then you're going to be one to that kind of Christian life. And so what it looks like here is that the, the, the philosophy of ministry has changed radically, okay? Now, and therefore, even with, apparently, I don't think you mentioned anything, Brandon, about an announcement of a change. You just saw the change and a whole lot of principles disappearing, and, it even, and, and no explanation given from the Church. It just seems to me, if there's going to be a transition of leadership and you have a, cha a, a significant shift or change in a philosophy of ministry, that you're going to do something different, you're going to posture different, you're going to have maybe some different goals, and I'm not even questioning the different posture of the goals at the moment. I'm just saying if you're going to make a big shift, it's really smart that you let everybody know what you're doing. We're moving in a new direction, and here's why. Here's why we believe that this is the right thing to do before the Lord. The culture is this and that, the circumstances are such and so, our city is here and whatever, here's our gifting, here's our capability, we're making a change. And so, therefore, the change in direction, which we think is a good change of direction, is going to mean a change in the way we do some things, and we think those are good changes, but here's the way the changes are going to look. And that means there's some people here that are not going to be on board, which is okay. Th this is the kind of communicate. I think a church in a circumstance, communication, I think a church in this kind of circumstance should be making, okay? We're making changes. We're bringing you on board. We're family. We're letting you know. Some of you may not be with it. Okay, that's fine. We, With our blessing, we encourage you to go somewhere else where you're going to feel more comfortable. We don't want people around here that don't like what's going on. And some of our leadership might feel that the new stuff is not their stuff, and so then you move on with our blessing, fine. Everything is out in the open and reasonably copacetic, you know? And <clears throat> this is, I think, this is the way it ought to be done. Apparently, that's not the way it was done in this particular case. 
you see the change, new pastor, the sermons seem to be pretty much on base, but kind of different lingo, maybe. Okay, people are different, but there's other things going on. To me, a real significant sign or evidence of concern is that people are on leadership uh, on the leadership team are leaving and you had a church that was heavily involved in making disciples and then you had groups that were doing that and then you have individual groups maybe not coming from the po- p- podium but you have individual groups that are advancing progressive ideas progressive meaning theologically or morally progressive ideas like promoting abortion all right. Now, you said, uh, Brandon, well, I don't want to judge. I don't want to be judgmental. But, of course, in this circumstance, you do have to make an assessment. And it doesn't mean you're being inappropriately condescending. That is the concern Jesus addressed in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, don't be looking at somebody, the speck in somebody else's eye when you got the log in your own. Uh, but he also said, don't throw what is holy to dogs, right? So there's an assessment that has to be made whether your audience that you're communicating with ought to receive the things that you're saying. All, tis only to say that there are assessments that Jesus even suggests that we make that aren't inappropriately judgmental. And I think you're facing one of that, all right? Um, you know, the, the music, that's a, that, that is a bellwether in my mind. Okay, we're going to this music because... This music appeals to a different group. Okay, well, it appeals to a different group for a reason. It's because it ain't Christian. <laughs> so, you know, why are you playing queen in a church? They can get that outside the church. You can, you, when you, the, the, what we are in, in <clears throat> what we are in vain, what we are looking to persuade people to do is to repent Okay, that means they, they're following one course of action, and we want them to pursue an t- entirely different course of action. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, so we're calling them to a whole new thing. Paul talks about, Paul talks about the trajectory in Romans chapter 8. Tra- trajectory for the flesh or towards the Spirit. These are trajectories that he's discussing. And um, so if we are going to communicate to the world about the good news of the gospel, we are inviting them to adopt a different trajectory on life, okay? Go in a different direction. So why would we appeal to them by tempting them with, in a certain sense, worldly goods? All of this music from these secular people that are not in the least ways Christian, and seem to be like on the rebel fringe, on the cool rebel fringe. And is this what we want to win people with? Look, at we're cool too, man. We like Queen. You can like Queen and be into that old stuff and still be a follower of Jesus. Well, I don't know if that really works. I remember when I became a Christian, there were a whole lot of things that ended up I ended up leaving behind. Not initially, but there was no posture like, oh, you can hang on to your premarital sex and your revolutionary thinking, your pro-abortion stuff and all that other stuff and still be fine with God. No, I realized that this wasn't part of the package. And it took me a while to kind of get all that stuff straightened out, and eventually I did, but um, it, 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 there wasn't this appeal that I can keep holding all the views about life th- that I used to, and in the rebellion that I think some of these views characterize, and and then be be cool with Jesus. No, I was invited to discipleship, put my hand to the plow, deny myself, follow Christ. And um, now back then there was a lot of big debate about whether rock and roll was the devil's music or whatever and what was really holy music. And I, I don't hold to all of that kind of fundy stuff. But when you have performers that are, that are singing songs from a position of kind of active rebellion against 
the culture and they're wild and bizarre and whatever, and even speaking things in their music that's clearly contrary to the Christian worldview. Well, what's the point? There are plenty of songs and music that you can sing that would be great, that communicate great things, that are theologically sound and are beautiful, for goodness sake, and are fun to sing. We don't have to kind of blend all of this secular Christian stuff together, so to speak. It, it, it's sending the wrong message. All right. So, so I guess what I would say, Brandon, is that, that um, y- 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 you're, it's probably time for a change. To put it simply, all of the things that you're seeing, clearly you're distressed by this. Clearly it troubles you, and understandably so. And, um, and the cha- this church has changed. That's clear. It's going in a different direction. That's clear. But they did not communicate well with the people, with the church, to let you know, here's where we're headed. Let's all move in the same direction. If you can't, got it then maybe someplace else is better for you. Didn't do that. Big mistake, especially with a big church, multi-campus church. And when insiders are just leaving, they're resigning, that is really a significant sign of problems because they're on the inside. They know what's going on better than the outsiders do. Maybe they're trying to leave quietly without making a ruckus, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they're on their way out. And so that might be a good evidence for you to be on your way out as well. Okay, so that's my suggestion, and uh, I guess that's the end of our show. So if I don't hear any music, oh, there it is. (laughs) Slow on the button here today. Greg Kokel for Stand to Reason, friends. Give them heaven. Bye-bye now.